do on this computer. There we go. So one of the most important things is following the rules for business travel. Okay. And the rules are pretty simple, but they are pretty strict in regards to um, the guidelines that they have. And it's when you stray outside of it that you end up with all of those uh, denied expenses. Okay. So this, these are their guidelines for business travel. Okay. And it's really simple to be deductible. And here's the most important part. It must be incurred while carrying on a genuine business activity. Okay. I know that sounds a little kind of <laughs> simplistic, but it really is very important. Um, what it means is when you are out doing business, not all of the business expenses are deductible. Um, they are up to a point. Usually most of the travel is, but um, a lot of the entertainment expenses and things like that, they are not necessarily deductible and you have to show that they are a genuine business activity. Okay. Cause what ends up happening a lot of times is they turn into parties that get out of hand and everybody wants to deduct them, but the IRS will not allow them. Okay. And secondly, they must be able to prove that they were an entertainment expense, including the meals that are directly related to the business. In other words, by prove, it means be able to show receipts typically. And by that, it would be, you know, race car expenses in, in Vegas normally are not related to your business. Okay, now there are times when you can give people tickets to games and things like that, tickets to events. Those are deductible up to a point. But if you're out there with a, um, taking them out, you know, to Vegas and out on the strip and you have huge expenses, they're probably not going to allow those to be deductible. So let's get into the details of it. Okay. Business travel, pretty simple. This means the actual travel itself, getting on the plane, getting in the car, business travel itself, okay? The actual travel expenses normally take a receipt. Now, when it, it involves uh, travel, you normally have a ticket, you normally have the record of the ticket, so your record keeping is pretty simple. You must keep receipts for all expenses over $75, which is not unheard of because all the hotels are going to give you a receipt. Most of the you know restaurants, you know, they're going to give you a receipt. If it is less than $75, they do not require it. The exception to that is lodging. Lodging does require no matter what for lodging, you have to have a receipt. So if you do stay at the Motel 6 and it's, you know, $35 for the night, you have to have it no matter what. Okay. So that's important. Um, the travel expense themselves are usually 100% deductible if it is business related. Now that means the actual transportation, um, hotel, lodging, that sort of thing. That is usually 100% deductible. Now, there is an exception. If a portion is your personal expense, like your wife comes with you, your husband comes with you, your spouse, you know, whatever, um, then it has to be divided. And it's based on a simple percentage. Okay, it's whatever percentage is business related, that is then divided um, uh, as your overall expenses and you do have to divide it. You have to show that if your spouse came with you, what percentage was taken um, by you and what percentage is taken by your spouse. 
um, and they will look into it. If, if you do get audited and they find out that your, um, your, your spouse went with you, they will expect to see the percentage. Okay. And they are sticklers about that. I have had people who were audited and they get asked for um, proof of the business travel. And this is where, this is one of the biggest things that, that people get audited for. And unfortunately, it's a thing that um, costs people the most in their refund. And the reason is, is they want to put, they think that everything is, everything on the trip is an expenditure. And unfortunately, it's not. And so they put everything, every receipt into it, and they just bundle it up together and say, well, this is the cost for that trip. And when it goes onto their taxes and they put it in there, the IRS looks at it and says, well, this was not part of it. This was not part of it. This is not business related. And you put this all into your travel expense. Well, it happened while I was on that trip. That's what, it was a business trip. Why can't I deduct it all? Well, because it wasn't directly related to the business. And that's the key thing. Um, it must be directly related to the business. Okay, now, there is also a difference. As you know, when you are um, away from home, that's different than when you're just traveling locally, okay? All the time. I've got to go from office to office all the time, okay? Those are regular transportation uh, expenses, okay? Because I'm moving during the day from office to office, well, that's a regular transportation expense. But if you have to stay overnight somewhere, people live. They have to live no matter what. And the IRS knows this, okay? So it doesn't allow you to deduct everything, okay? So when you are away, that is different than if you are just traveling locally. If you're away from home, you can only deduct 50% for meals and entertainment. The reason is you're going to have, even if you were at home, you're going to have expenses. Well, they assume, they, they assume that you're going to also have those expenses if you're on the road. So they let you take 50% of the meals and entertainment when you're away from home. All right. Now, what does that mean when I'm away from home? Usually any time that you have to stay overnight or you are um, experiencing like a trip, not just a day trip where you're going somewhere, but someplace where you are traveling outside of the area that you normally work in. Um, either you have a special transportation for an event or something like that where it's not just a normal route okay if you're just visiting one of your local branches that's one thing but if you are going and actually visiting going to an event a conference a meeting something like that where it's a, a uh, an exception to a normal route that would normally be something where it's away from home okay now away from home home's definition is more or less your home region okay so if you travel a certain area uh, for deliveries, that sort of thing, that's considered your home, okay? Now, if you do have to, if you're required to eat in that home area, if you are required to stay overnight, that is an exception, okay? That actually does count as being, um, as being away, okay? So anytime you have to stay overnight, that is count, counted as being away. Hang on a second. I'm just going to decline this. There we go. All right. Now, when you are traveling, um, entertainment with customers at a restaurant or other location 
even though it sounds like you would be uh, that it would be deductible, it is still a meal and as a, as entertainment. If it is away from home, it is only still fifty percent deductible. Now there are some exceptions to this, but overall entertainment and meals is only 50% deductible even if you are entertaining customers at a restaurant or, or other location um, if you are attending a business convention meeting or luncheon anything of that nature then again like I said it is even if it's in with your home area if it's a one-off thing like that where you are going to a convention it's at 50% um, and here's the one that's actually kind of interesting. If you actually are there getting an educational, if there's a deductible educational expense, if you're getting a deduction for the education, they will only allow you 50% of the meals if it's an educational seminar. Why they do that, that's one of those IRS rules. I'd figure if you were there getting an education, you know, hey, that's what you're trying to do for business. But no, that's only all of those are considered away from home and only 50% for meals and entertainment. Okay. Now, there are some exceptions. And this is important. Okay. The limit exceptions. These are 100% deductible to the employer. And that's the important part. These are not deductible to the person. Okay. These are 100% deductible to the employer. And you'll understand why here. Meals are included in the employee's wages. So in other words, if they are getting paid, that becomes an expense to the employer. Okay. It's a regular expense. They are paying for the meal for the employee and it goes onto their um onto their uh uh expenses as a regular business expense so they are considered 100 percent deductible but that is 100 percent deductible to the employer it is not 100 percent deductible to the employee mm. okay which i know for some employees that would suck because you'd figure, well, hey, it's my meal expense. Well, if you're already getting paid for it in your uh, in your wages, you're not also going to be able to deduct it from your taxes. Okay. Fringe benefits. Now, this is a really important one. If the company is buying donuts and coffee, guess what? Those are deductible to the business. That's an important one because we need to have our donuts and coffee. I don't think there is life without donuts and coffee. So that one's really important. Um, it does allow us to buy them as a company. So the employer can deduct them. That includes, by the way, Starbucks and all that too, which is good. Um, <laughs> this one, any meals they make available to the general public. And it has to be though, here's the important part, it has to be meals made to the general public as a promotional activity. So in other words, they are trying to drum up business. So they offer these meals not just as a, um, like as a, uh, um, a food shelter. Instead, they are actually offering these meals as a promotional dinner, that sort of thing. Um, now uh, I'm not sure how it works. I'd have to look into it, but I don't know if that means that, uh, things like where you spend that, uh, amount at a political action campaign and you buy the $500 plates, you know, I don't know if those are considered deductible in that sense. Um, but if they're made available to the general public as a promotional activity, then yes, it is considered 100% um, deductible to the employer. 
if you are part of a catering service, okay? So in other words, caterers that offer meals to their employees while they're at the catering, you know, they cater parties. Um, and while you're at the party, you're allowed to have your meals with the catered food. That is considered 100% deductible to the employer. Now, again, like I said, the reason you have to know these only because they're considered an expense um, where they're 100% deductible. And this is things that would be on the test. All right. In reality for us, I mean, let's be honest. How many people do we have out there who are, I mean, we do have some people who do, do have catering businesses. And Sheila, have you got any people who have a catering business? Maybe she's not on. But I've, I, I know several people who have uh, a catering business. And as a result, they, are, um, they offer the meals to their employees. Uh, the casino offers meals to their employees. And as a result, it's deductible to them. How about the coffee to clients? Uh, coffee to clients is an expense. Those are the fringe benefits, like I said, that fringe benefit of donuts and coffee that uh, they offer out. Only for employees. Right. Also for right. clients. If they offer to comply to, to clients, because those are meals offered to the general general public. Um those are considered refreshments. That's just a regular expense of doing business. Um, so yes, one hundred percent deductible. Right, because that's a regular expense of doing business. Um, it's very important when you think about that that you know you're trying to keep your clients happy, and you can't do that if you don't offer certain things to make them comfortable. Now that's a different than actually taking them out to dinners and things like that and uh, trying to win their business over. That's an exception. And we'll get into that a little bit here in a second, but um, we skipped one here. Um, now this is kind of funny, but meals used as a team building activity. In other words, if you have um, a meeting to get together and it's a team meeting, that sort of thing, and you have a dinner for it, that is 100% deductible to the, uh, to the company. And that's actually a good thing because it helps promote um, the team, uh, the team building. It's very important. And it uh, allows you to get together and do things. It's for when we have uh, the expenses for like the uh, uh, summer activities and things like that. Okay. But, but why is it potluck? <laughs> we, we still well, have to have the budget for it. Part of the problem. Huh? Part of the problem is we still have to have the budget for it. Yeah. And a lot of times, even though it is deductible, um, okay. they still don't want to uh, to uh, um, put anything out for it. Um, so sometimes that's uh, that that's part of the reason why and it's i don't agree that that if there i, I think that if you're going to have something we should have you know the company should have some regular team building um activities like that because it helps promote our our knowledge of each other, our activities, that's really important. And when we don't have it, it's, you know, it's, it's not as much fun. So I think we should have it more often, but that's just me. Um, and this is what's really funny is some of the ships um, that are, our vessels require them to pay, to, pay their crew basically in the form of meals. So they are required to have meals supplied on the ship uh, to all their crew members as part of their pay. And so as a result, 
they are 100% deductible because by federal law, they're supposed to do it. Okay, so those meals are considered tax deductible. And there is one final one, which I don't think will affect us very much, but who knows, we do have some people who do come down from Alaska, but anybody who works on any of the oil or gas plas platforms in Alaska, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, they need to be supplied their meals. Um, they are living on site, and as a result, uh, they do require that they are supplied with their meals. So those meals as a result are considered 100% deductible to the employer. Now that's the important part. All of these are not deductible to the employee. They are deductible to the employer. All right. Now, there are some special rules here for the, from the Department of Transportation. These are for people who are in trucks, trains, planes, anything like that, that are long, long term, um, long range haulers, things like that. They have a special set of rules. And the reason is, is because they are on the road for a long period of time. So they have a special set of rules that those businesses can deduct 80% of the meals. But they are special cases. All right. So they get a deduct, and this is important. So this is probably one of those that you want to note because I know that in a couple of cases, this has appeared on the test. Mm -hmm. Um and I know it sounds weird to think that why would you want, why would this matter so much? It's because it's one of those one off things that they have a tendency to ask on the test um, to make sure you were paying attention kind of thing. Um, it's one of those questions that I don't agree with, but it always ends up seem, seeming to show up. So I'm going to let you know about it ahead of time that this is one that you should probably, that this is one screen you should probably note here. And these are the exceptions to the rules for the Department of Transportation. When you have pilots, okay, they're in the air for a long period of time. And those pilots, as a result, get to have their meals on board the plane. And when they have those meals, they get to have them. And as a result, and ironically enough, even though they taste terrible. Um, I mean, I don't know of too many people who like airplane meals, <laughs> but the uh, airline meals, they get to deduct 80% of those meals. Um, the reason is, like I said, they're in a plane for a long period of time. And as a result, they have to eat. They're pilots, okay? Well, not only that, Ryan, my son is a pilot. Uh -huh. And when he's not in the plane and they take him to a hotel, he's required to furnish his own meal. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's the other thing too. They have the layovers. That has got to be one of the worst parts of that job is always ending up having to, well, in some ways, I guess it could be kind of fun in, in a sense. You could have a layover in a different city all the time, but you're living out of a bag. And I know that sometimes exactly. that, that's got to be because I have a friend who's a pilot and he says, you know, when he was younger, it was the greatest thing in the world to have a layover all the time. You know, he could go to different cities and enjoy it, you know. But as he got older, it became where you are living out of a bag. Right. And, you know, I, even washing your clothes was along the lines of you only have so many pairs of clothes you have with you. Mm -hmm. And you are constantly traveling. And he right. said, even though it was a lot of fun where you'd see these cities, you'd actually spend the time on your layover getting ready for the next layover. Sure. And he said it, it was fun. You'd be able to see some sites when you were younger, but as you got older, it became a job. And he says, it's, he's, that was the one thing that was bad. And I, I, I actually, you know, I can see that. I, I could understand that that would be a lot of work. 
you know, to constantly be living out of a bag from hotel to hotel to hotel. And especially in a different city each, each night, Mm -hmm. um, you know, not knowing where anything is. I mean, face it, what do we, what do we like to do when you're at home and you want, you're hungry for something, you know, where to hit, you know what you're hungry for, right? You know what restaurants are right there. You know what you're hungry for. You go, okay, I'm going to hit, it's up the street. I'm going to go to this one. You know, I'll go to this one. We're in a different city. You may not necessarily even face it. There's a difference when you don't speak the language, you know, or you're in a different country. You're in a different city. You don't know where things are. And you just are, you know, I, I, I feel for them in a lot of ways because I did a lot of traveling when I was younger. I had to, for business, I had to fly from city to city a lot of times and from country to country, even, um, when I was younger and it was different. You know, I mean, some of it was fun when I was in my twenties and early thirties when I was originally doing it. Oh, that was the coolest thing in the world going from city to city and that sort of thing. But as I got older, man, it's a whole lot different when you're hauling stuff around all the time. And I can imagine a pilot having to do that all the time. Yep. I mean, I, 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 I actually feel sorry for them because you don't even, you know, and they get transferred from flight to flight. So yeah, you're be, on four, you're off three, and yeah. you could be in some, you know, icky hotel in North Platte, North Dakota. Yeah, and, there you go. You don't have... You don't have any transportation. That's the other thing, yeah. Yeah. So, you're yeah, stuck. it can be pretty icky. Yeah, you're stuck there. It's not like, you know, you get to go and and party. No. You know, it's not like, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna go out and you only have so much that you can spend during that thing because you have and, a... Yeah, and you're off 12. You're off 12 hours and you're, you're back in the plane again. Right. And on top of it, if something happens that, do you get shifted from that flight to a different flight because your flight was underbooked or whatever and they shifted they canceled that flight and stick you on a different flight all of a sudden you were originally planning on going to this city and now you're going to this one Mm -hmm. and so yeah i understand pilots they uh their lifestyle i mean danny is one of my best friends and he is a pilot and he was he flew international flights and I got to say that that, that kind of a lifestyle, he goes, honestly, when he was younger, it was a lot of fun going to a bunch of different cities, but in truth, you only had, you know, between getting your clothes ready for the next one and getting, going out there, you've maybe had three or four hours. You could actually do something. Right. And I don't know. I, I just... I, I I felt sorry for him after a while because he never could. The other thing too is it's always a strain on your relationships. If you have a you know if you're if you're married and you are flying all the time, it's it's a big strain. Mm-hmm. You know, he said that he goes, you know, you're out there flying and it's not it's not as glamorous as it looks. No, it's not you know, at all. So. And so, yeah, so I used to, I, I understand that one. And the next one is actually really just as bad. Interstate truck operators and bus drivers is regulated by the Department of Transportation. Okay, my uncle owns a trucking company out of Ohio. They run stuff from... Uh, Columbus, Cleveland, you name it, they're making runs all the time. Now, luckily, his runs um, now, because he owns the trucking company, are the shorter runs. Okay, but I remember when I was younger and his runs were the week-long runs where he's gone for a week, sometimes two. And I hate to tell you, but those runs suck. Okay, you are living in the cab of a truck. And those sleeper cabs, um, those are really not that comfortable. 
I mean, I know in the movies, it's kind of like, oh, it looks really cool. You get to jump in the back and there's a bed back there and all this. Guys, there is nothing back there. Okay. And the things like Convoy and those really neat movies where, you know, Smoking and the Bandit, you know, um, you do not get to actually enjoy where you are in the truck and you do not get to, um, it's not a sightseeing thing. Okay. It's not a, it's not, you are a truck driver. Okay. And depending on what you're hauling, um, if you're hauling hazardous material, all of a sudden you're responsible for what's in the truck. So those guys, they are required to stay by the truck. So what they are doing, uh, it is, there's a lot more involved than a lot of people think. And those guys, they, they, they earn what they, what they make. Okay. They really do. And the bus drivers, honestly, honest to God, I've seen these bus drivers. If you ever taken one of those Greyhound buses, I hate to tell you, but those Greyhound buses are not comfortable. And I don't know how the drivers take the bus and keep going. Cause that would just, I don't know especially when they're going across multiple states. Um, Cause they, at least with a pilot, they've got the facilities on board the plane to at least have some real food and whatnot. There is an almost bathroom on the plane. You know, it's not exactly a big bathroom, but there's at least an almost bathroom on the plane for those buses man, those things are not really designed. I mean, there are some that are really kind of nice and whatnot, but most of them, the Greyhound buses, are not exactly designed for a whole lot of comfort. Back in the 90s, um, I was a single mom of, of two, and uh, um, I couldn't afford to, to fly, so I had, you know, grandparents and parents in three different states, so I took Greyhound buses all the time with two young kids and it was I mean we eventually learned how to do it but it was awful. Yeah, yeah. I you. I oh. just you know I mean because when I was growing up my parents couldn't afford to fly um so our trips and like I said my my dad's family lived in Ohio and we were here in Portland so our trips were okay, it's vacation time. Vacation meant we packed everything into the car or the, and it was the pickup truck camper kind of thing. Okay. And shoved everything in there for a two week, whatever. And the idea wasn't to see the stuff along the way. The stuff, the idea was to get to Ohio as fast as we could. So we could spend as much time there with the family and then turn around and drive back as fast as humanly possible so we could get back on time so he could get back to work on time. So there was no fun in between. We even did this in a uh, Chevy Citation once, the hatchback. Oh, that was a blast. Um, and uh, me and my sister sitting in the back seat wanting to fight each other all the time, you know, so... <laughs> It's, you know, I, so I understand those bus drivers trying to live out of a bus doing that all the time. Oh, I'm sorry. I feel sorry for them. So they, they earn every deduction they can get. They earn it. Um, the railroad employees, at least they've got, you know, a little bit better, I think, facilities on some of the railroad cars. I don't know about the engineers. I've never seen where they're actually at in the on the railroad cars. I hope they have some better facilities for the conductors and whatnot, but um, I don't know. I've seen the pilot ones. I've seen the truck driver ones. I've seen the bus ones. I've never seen the railroad ones. And this one is the Coast Guard. I've seen the Coast Guard facilities. Those are pretty cramped. And so those all have special regulations. 
Okay. These are the ones that have it. Um, I've got a friend who's in the auxiliary coast guard. Um, I've seen the facilities out at Warrington where they have the coast guard base. Um, I've been out there with him. Those are not exactly luxury facilities. So they are out on the water for a very long time then come back. And, um, so all their meals and everything, when they're on the boat, they can't exactly pull in and get Burger King. <laughs> um, you know, at least, you know, some of the others can stop. I mean, planes can't exactly stop, but they at least get the layovers. Railroad, you know, they actually, actually do get those small stops in the towns. Coast Guard, nah, there's nothing out by them. So they're, they're pretty much stuck. When they pull into a port, they get lucky. Um, but uh, so those those deductions, they earn them. Okay, so really, that's those are ones you want to memorize, and those are ones you want to know. Um, now there is a special way. Now remember something: these are all where you're keeping the receipts. The IRS is really strict about those receipts, but they do have an exception to that. They can let you do one other way. It's called a per diem rate. Now, they do not favor a per diem rate, and they look at them really heavily when you claim a per diem rate because you're usually claiming it because you can't prove all of your stuff. And it was designed to make the record keeping easier. And it's an alternative method um, for the business travel. And what it has is it has a set rate for business expenses in lieu of actual records. So in other words, there's a set amount for um, your business travel and it has it with and without lodging. Okay, so it, it hasn't said if you just have meals for the day or if you actually have lodging rates. Okay, now that's really important because if you are claiming this, they are going to look very heavily at what you were doing. Okay, they look at the purpose of your travel then. Um, now, what that means is not necessarily that you are trying to cheat the IRS, but that you don't have the actual receipts to prove what you were doing. And you're just stating, I did this. Um, they don't, I, I don't know how to put it. Uh, they don't uh, question it so much if you do this on a regular basis and your job is related to it. In other words, uh, you're a salesman on the road all the time. They understand it because it really becomes hard to do your job all the time if you uh, are trying to keep records all the time. Some people do it very well. All right, I, I have a friend who, uh, who hauls boats around. They're an independent contractor, and he owns his own truck. And uh, what they do is they haul large boats. He and his wife do it together. And they, anytime you got to move a boat, he just hooks the trailer up and moves it from place to p place to place. Her job is to do all the accounting, and they keep a great record of everywhere they go. Okay, so their accounting is easy, but um, a lot of people do not keep the best records. And so as a result, they use a per diem rate. And the IRS understands that sometimes it's hard uh, to keep accurate records, and they do allow that. But again, like I said, they are going to look at it to make sure that you are not just doing it because... You want to be able to say I did these things and not um, and not actually be able to prove it. Um, and here's the one thing that you really got to know. A self-employed person 
may only use the per diem rate for meals. They cannot use the one for lodging. Mm -hmm. If you are a self-employed person, you have to have your receipts for lodging. And that one's really important. Um, they will not allow it the other way. That they will not allow you to just state your uh, lodging expenses if you're, if you're self-employed. All right. All right. Now, that's typically about travel and meals. Okay. Now, that's the normal one. Now, by meals, we're talking about your regular breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, that's specifically um, your regular ones, not where you're entertaining, but where you are um, just having your regular daily meal, your three meals a day. Okay, the exception to that is where you're entertaining. Okay, and that's what we're going to cover next. And what we're gonna do is I need just a minute break because I gotta run to the restroom. So we're gonna take five minutes really quick. Okay. All right, and then we'll be right back in about five minutes. Okay. Okay.
Hi guys, sorry about that delay. As you guys know, my mom is here in a wheelchair and sometimes makes my life really interesting. Really interesting. Um, mainly because I, She's constantly in pain, and I can't always do something about it. I'm sorry. Good boy, there. I just, you know, you always want to help your family, and you want to, you know, love them and do everything you can, especially your mom, but there's sometimes it's out of your hands, and you can't do anything about it, and you just really hurts frustrating it is and you you know that they're in pain and you you know i i was on the phone yesterday with the doctors to get her her oxycodone because they screwed up her prescription actually she has no cartilage anymore in her shoulders and so both shoulders hurt just sitting there doing nothing and the nurse's advice until they get it straight is pretty much put ice on it and elevate them yeah, that helps, you know. Oh, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, because they can't fill her prescription because it's supposed to be, she's supposed to have, you know, one oxy every four hours kind of thing. And anyway. Yeah, because of the new, the new laws. And then so people that live with chronic pain, um, I, I, I know exactly, I, I've had three back surgeries and it's horrible. But with the new laws, it's just like, what am I supposed to do? I don't get paid for medication anymore. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of the way it's going. So every time I, I'm trying to get it straight and I get a hold of the doctors and they say, oh, she just take it one tablet twice a day. Mm -hmm. I'm going, that doesn't touch it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going, that doesn't help her at all. And I'm talking to a 75 year old lady who's in a wheelchair who can't lift her arms more than about eight inches. You know? mm -hmm. wow. and, and it's like, you know, and the pain is terrible. So if she wants to try to lay in bed, you know, I have a hospital bed here for her that she sleeps in. And they say, well, just make sure she's kind of sitting there with pillows under both sides. And I'm going and ice it and take Tylenol, lots of Tylenol. But you can only take so many Tylenol a day because she also has kidney failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wrecks your liver too. You know, so I'm going guys you guys no help you know kind of you know it's just like they really they really aren't they're not just no help they're, you know you, you just want to go so hopefully the doctor will get back today and say yes i've corrected the prescription mm -hmm. but in the meantime i've got a mom going it really hurts you know and i'm like Mom, I can't do anything about it. You know, I really can't. I don't have anything. To, she, she's out of her oxycodone, and they won't fill it till Wednesday. Oh, boy. You know, you know, and it's like, unless the doctor says otherwise, they won't fill it till Wednesday. And she's got the calls into the doctor, but until that gets resolved, nothing. So, one of those things. So, but anyways. Let's get back to what we were doing. Entertainment. Guys, when you have a meal, that's your normal meals during the day. And that's the normal expense. Everybody knows what they are. That's your, I'm running through Burger King. I'm going to have, you know, my normal dinner, my normal um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, that sort of thing. Entertainment is a little bit different. Entertainment normally means dinner out with clients, uh, meeting with uh, prospective employees, um, going out and 
uh, doing something for business. In other words, usually with somebody um, to uh, to uh, get their business or to you know team building, something like that. Okay. Now those entertainment expenses are then different than a regular uh, meal. And they usually involve some activity, a larger dinner, um, a bigger event than just going and having a regular meal expense. And as a result, the IRS looks at them a whole lot differently and treats them a whole lot differently. Okay, so for enter entertainment expenses, you are allowed to deduct to deduct 50% of the business related expenses. Now that is the most expense, most, uh, uh, most important word up there is business. Okay. The reason is if you do not have it as a business, it's not deductible. So in other words, if you take somebody and don't, uh, don't have a justifiable reason for taking them out and doing it, they're not going to allow you to deduct it. Now, there are people who give you tickets to games. There are gifts. Those are business gifts, and we treat them a little bit, li a little bit different. But going out and having dinner and going out and, and spending an evening with somebody, it does occur. But the IRS has really strict rules, and this is what the IRS audits. And this is what they look at. It must, and I cannot stress this enough, it must be directly related or associated with the business. Okay? So in other words, going, if you are a race car driver and you're trying to hire a race car driver, Yes, going to Vegas and going to the race car strips it would be acceptable, okay? Because that is related. If you've got some guy who's a salesman who's really into race cars and that sort of thing, and you want to try to get him to do it, taking him down to the uh, where they get a you know drive a Formula One race car or one of the high end sports cars. Guys, unfortunately, that's not related to the business. Okay. I know you. it would sound like I'm trying to get his business and I'm trying to use something that is something he enjoys. It's not. Um, unfortunately, in the past, I know a lot of people had the thing that you only discuss business on the golf course. Um. Country club memberships used to be deductible. Country club memberships are no longer deductible, okay? No matter what, going out with your buddies and taking the prospective buyer out golfing is not considered a business expense anymore, okay? Even if you all love golfing, okay? Unless that person is a professional golfer, or he sells golf clubs or something like that where it's related to the business, it's not deductible. Even though you guys all enjoy it and even though you're trying to get his business, it doesn't count anymore. Okay? And I know that sucks for a lot of people, but that is the truth and that is the law. Now, here is the next most important thing. It must be in a clear business setting. And they will determine whether there are substantial distractions at the location. Now, I hate to tell you why this came about. Um, anybody have any ideas? Strip clubs? Strip clubs. Mm -hmm. They used to hold meetings in strip clubs, okay? They used to take their prospective buyer out to a strip club, put about 500 bucks in singles in his hand, and say, go to town, okay? 
that's more or less a business expense. Put some drinks in him, a couple of cigars, and a couple of naked girls in front of him. <laughs> okay? And that's how they got business. Um, that setting, <laughs> obviously, unless you are a strip club owner, is not related to your business in any sense of the word. Okay? Um, it must be a clear business setting. Okay, so it's no longer deductible if you're having it in a strip club or a gentleman's club, however you want to put it. Okay, or uh, the Apollo, you know, one of those um, those different scenes, or the golf club, the uh, country club. The country club is not a business setting. Now, there is an exception to that. Country clubs, to get around that, a lot of them actually established in their clubhouse a, a real restaurant, okay, that is open to the public. In other words, um, a lot of them have a, a now famous in a lot of cases, high-end restaurant where business does can take place because that is considered a restaurant where business can occur. Um, out on the golf course, though, and the golf club, the golf fees, you know, the tee time, uh, the the green fees, are not considered business expenses. Um. So the setting is looked at. The other thing is where it says substantial distractions. Okay. So if you are sitting on the 50 yard line of a football game, okay, odds are you are not talking about business. Okay. Odds are you are watching the football game. Okay. If you are at a basketball game and you are, you have, uh, courtside seats, or you are up in, now, again, here is the exception. At basketball games, they have skyboxes. Skyboxes were built so that corporations can own a skybox, and they can conduct business there. They actually have conference rooms, kind of. They have tables, food, and they have the view spots where they can sit and watch the game and all. But in some cases, those are actually considered a meeting room, okay, because you can conduct business there, okay, and they are separate from, in a sense, the distractions of the game. Now, courtside seats are not as, uh, do not count as, as a, a, a business room, okay. But up in the skyboxes where you can conduct business, the IRS does allow business to be conducted there. Okay. I know that's kind of like, it sounds like it's splitting hairs, but that's part of the reason why those were built, I think, is because they needed a way to get around the IRS laws. Okay. So... They were built with the intent that they can do business in them and then partially watch the game. Um, if you're in um, a sports bar, okay, because think about it. You're sitting in a sports bar having lunch. There's distractions all the way around you because there's TVs in every corner of the room. But is designed so you can conduct business there. Okay. It's really close to having substantial distractions. Um, the substantial distractions are if you are actively participating or, or rooting for kind of thing, the sport or the activity. All right. Strippers in front of you, you're paying attention usually to the strippers, okay? Basketball game in front of you, you're paying attention to the basketball game. 
if you are up in a room that is separate from the game, you can conduct business and not necessarily be watching the game. Okay. That's where they, that's where they make the distinction. But that is kind of really close to making the distinction between the two really kind of like it's a gray area. So now here is probably the most ex important part of this. It cannot be lavish or extravagant. Now here's the problem with that statement. Who's to be the judge? Now, unfortunately, it is the IRS agent. Um, lavish or extravagant, if you are a diamond exchange broker, okay, lavish and extravagant may seem like nothing to you, all right? that sitting down to a, you know, $500 plate may be normal. Um, if you work in a high-end art gallery or uh, something of that nature, that may not be extravagant to you. That may be your normal place, okay, where you do business. Now, you are going to have to prove that to the IRS agent that that is your normal way of conducting business and the normal place where you would conduct business. But that is something where you would um, be able to, because they are really kind of broad terms, lavish or extravagant, and because it would depend upon your business, um, if you work at Sotheby's, Sotheby's, you know, the Christie's, um, the high end auction house or something like that, you may be dealing with multimillion dollar items, um, where the dinners would be something that we would go, you know, a normal person would go, that's ridiculous, you know, and to them, that would be a normal exchange. So the definition of lavish or extravagant is pretty broad. But what it becomes is, is it for the industry? Okay, and that's the most important part. Is it lavish and extravagant for the situation or the industry? But that is the, a very important thing. If you are a steel worker, and your boss is taking you out to lunch and your normal yearly salary is like $40,000 a year and dinner is like $300, $400 a plate for each of you, that would be a little extravagant. Okay. And the IRS would probably look at it and go, that is not something we can deduct. Okay. So you have to look at the industry and you have to look at the participants, the people who are in it and ask, is this lavish or extravagant by these standards, by what industry it is, by the participants. And that's why they're, I know they sound really broad in those terms, lavish or extravagant, but it's based upon the industry. That's why it doesn't have a set dollar amount. That why that's why it doesn't say you know it it cannot be over a hundred dollars a plate it cannot be over you know this it doesn't say that it just has that term because you can if you can prove that it is normal for that industry then yes it would not be um, considered extravagant or lavish. Um, but that's up to the IRS agent and for you to prove. Okay. Do we understand the distinction in that? Yeah. Yeah. Because I know when, when I say that it's really, <laughs> it's really a broad category. Okay. Now when I say entertainment, 
remember, if you are going to some place where it is like you give somebody tickets to something, that's actually considered a gift. Okay, so if you're giving somebody tickets to some place, that's really not um, the entertainment expense. That's a gift. And we treat that as differently as a business gift. But it's where you're going with them and you are um, paying for the entertainment, paying for the evening, that sort of thing. Now, it's not expected. Now, now you have to understand something. By entertainment, you are not expected to not have entertainment there. Okay? So if you go to some place that, does have entertainment, that's fine. But it cannot be so extreme that uh, that uh, it is um, notable. In other words, it can't be so extreme that it is obviously outside of, that, that you were trying to win this person over just by making something lavish. If you take them to a dinner theater or something like that, and they're having a good time with that, that's well, that's one thing. If you take them out to courtside seats at a basketball game, that's some, but something entirely different. Okay. The other thing is, it is based on the face value. Okay. When you buy tickets, how do you buy tickets? Oh, Ticketmaster? Ticket yeah. Ticketmaster. Well, here's the problem with Ticketmaster. You know that Ticketmaster Master is basically a ticket scalping company, right? Yes. Okay, most people don't realize that that's actually how Ticketmaster basically began. They are a bunch of ticket scalpers that became legal in the way they ticket scalp. Okay. Does anybody know what ticket scalping means? You buy tickets and then charge more than the ticket is worth. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you have a ticket, you go and you buy them up, and you buy up a certain number of tickets, and then you resell them at an increased price, and you more or less charge a fee instead of a ticket price. Anybody know what the ticket price is of the tickets? When you buy a ticket from Ticketmaster, it's the ticket price on the face of the ticket. The rest of it is basically their associated fee. Yeah, they call it a service fee. Mm -hmm. It's because they can't charge more than the ticket fee. Okay, it's illegal. Okay, the ticket fee is how much you can buy for the ticket. Now, here's the important part. How much can you charge for a ticket. In other words, how much can you deduct for a ticket? The ticket price. Okay, now how Without much is Without the that? service fee. Without the service fee. Right. So it is the face value. Mm -hmm. As much as that sucks, it is the face value. Yeah, back in the in the 80s and early 90s, the ticket scalpers were just so unbelievable. I mean, I got like second row tickets to, to everything, but they were able to advertise in the newspaper and, you know, all of that. Yep. And they, that's, well, that's why they say that, you know, oh, wow, they got tickets going to the Olympics for $2,000 a seat. Yeah, well, they didn't cost $2,000 a seat. You know, they cost... 50 bucks a seat. Mm -hmm. That's because they bought them up at $50 a seat and resold them at $2,000 a seat. Yeah. Um, my uh, oldest son bought uh, my youngest daughter tickets to Billie Eilish um, last month, I think it was. And um, he's like going, there's like a thousand dollar seats. I can only afford the $60 ones. I'm like, don't there you go. We'll be in the nosebleed section. We don't care. We just want to go. It's kind, of, it's kind of funny when you go on there and you see that, oh, well, tickets are going on sale for $20 a ticket. No, that's <laughs> $20 a ticket from the actual 
venue if you're lucky to get them. But then if you actually have to go get them from Ticketmaster, they cost $175 a ticket. Not exactly a, a savings. That's like we're going to, uh, my mom really wants to go to see Neil Sadaka and we got a bunch of us going and all this. Well, he's going to be at the ALNA. Well, we bought them literally the day they came out from the ALNA. Well, that's a whole lot different than if you go to Ticketmaster now and they're $150 a ticket. So, yeah, it's it, it's, a, it's a lot different. But the most important part is when it comes to the deducting those expenses, the only thing you can deduct is 50% of the face value. Ah, uh, 50%. Mm -hmm. You can only deduct. Uh, because it. it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's an entertainment expense. And it's the face value. That's the most important thing. So no matter what, even though you spent 500 bucks on those season tickets, guess what? It's not going to be that. For that one game, you found a ticket scalper who was selling, you know, tickets to a Bears game for uh, 800 bucks. Great. You got your two tickets. That's 1600 bucks. You know what? Tickets are only 75 bucks. So... It's 150 bucks, so your deductible amount is 75 bucks. 75 is on the ticket. Yep, 75 bucks a ticket is what's and on the ticket. They are selling it at higher. Yeah, like that? ticket scalpers will sell it for whatever they can get. Okay. Because and people don't realize that Ticketmaster is a ticket scalper. No, they don't think they think the Ticketmaster is legit because it's actually accepted now by all the ticket venues as a ticket reseller. Um, but they don't realize that Ticketmaster sells them based upon how close you are, um, at whatever value they can get, and the prices go up the closer to the concert it gets. They're an online ticket scalper. And uh, they're really good at it. They have, they actually have their computer systems that immediately start buying up tickets the day for every concert they think will sell out. They buy tickets to every concert. Mm -hmm. And as a result, then they can resell them. Sure, they may take a loss on one concert, something like that. But man, their concerts, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars on. You got when Garth Brooks came out, when Garth Brooks would, back in uh, the uh, 90s, when Garth Brooks was uh, in Chicago, I would pay literally 50 bucks a ticket. That's what the cost was to get tickets. And mm -hmm. if you wanted to get the tickets I had, Tickets were going for $900 a ticket for the tickets I, that I actually got because we were out there literally a day before tickets went on sale. He sold out tickets to, uh, um, it was the Rosemont Horizon, and he sold them out within an hour for the first concert. And we were out there literally a day and a half in advance in line and we got tickets in the front section uh front side section that i could get 900 dollars per ticket my brother and i stood um in line for two days to get michael jackson tickets way there back when there you go and uh it was pretty impressive i mean you could get a lot of money for tickets people wanted those tickets and they couldn't wait in line like that. I mean, I was in college. I was willing to do it. You know. And if you want to make some really good cash, you could actually work for the ticket scalpers. Get in line because they couldn't, uh, because they put limits on the number of tickets you could get. You know, if you're waiting in line. Ticket scalpers, you know, you could buy five tickets at a time. Four tickets at a time, something like that. Five tickets at a time. So we'd have three or four of us in line. We'd each get the next greatest, cause, and they would sell them based on the next tickets in line were the next highest spaces. 
you would just tell them more or less what price range you wanted. And that was it. They'd sell, sell you the next closest tickets. And we'd buy them up, sell them to the ticket scalpers for a couple of hundred bucks and a low end ticket that they had, you know, one up in the nosebleed seats. And so we'd get nosebleed seats and a couple hundred bucks for our tickets. He'd go sell the tickets we just got for 900 bucks, whatever. So we'd get more or less free tickets to the concert and a couple hundred bucks for waiting in line. It was worth it for us. We didn't have to try to sell them to somebody else. And, and on top of it, a lot of times the ticket scalpers, you see them, they'd actually stand out in, out in front of the uh, venue trying to sell them the night before. No, that was always a pain. But the most important thing to remember then is it's the face value of the ticket. Not what the ticket scalpers get. <laughs> not, what the t- not, what, not what Ticketmaster gets. Because Ticketmaster did so much business, and that's actually kind of how they got away with it. Ticketmaster did so much business, they actually kind of made an agreement with these venues that, you know, look, you sell them to me, let me get in electronically and get as many as I can. I'll buy up what we need and I'll guarantee I'll buy so many for each concert. And they made an agreement with them. I'll be a professional ticket scalper. Well, it's a cool deal if you can do it, you know, and Ticketmaster has. Ticketmaster is literally, you know, they sell tickets from around the world, actually. You know, they don't just sell them here. They sell them in Europe. They sell tickets for concerts in Europe and all over. So I'd say they're doing pretty good. So, but remember, the important thing is it's 50% of the face value. Not what those ticket, ticket scalpers got. So no matter what you spend on them, it's just the face value. All right. Now, transportation. Okay. When you're talking about transportation costs, this is the use of cars, trucks, vehicles, visiting customers. This is actually the cost of moving from one location to another. Okay. It is the rental cost of the car, okay? It is the um, flight tickets. It is for visiting customers when they need a rental car. It is the lease payments on your vehicles. It is your mileage, okay? Now, this is the important things. There are certain rules for this. Okay, because a lot of people try to claim, especially self-employed people, they want to figure out what their home base is. And that's the important thing. If you're self-employed, what is your normally what is normally your home base? Your office. Your office. But here's the question. Where is your office? Home. In a lot of cases. <laughs> can be home, can be somewhere else. Can yeah. be somewhere else can be home but that's the important thing is you have to establish where it is okay and you may have actually two home bases too that's the other thing too um like i really i work out of the house a lot and i work out of stark so you know my home base is technically stark so you know it it does change a lot but you have to establish which one is your home base. And when you're driving, here's mm-hmm. the important thing. Going from your home, because this is mileage, and this is business expenses. This is the most important one that most people get wrong. And as a result, end up owing refunds on their money that they got. Okay, they owe it back. I should say, a penalty back to the IRS. They claim that mileage from their home to where they usually do business 
is an expense because they're self-employed. Mm. Okay. If I'm a real estate agent, all right, where do I usually work out of? The real estate office. The real estate, estate office. office. Oh. I know I that most people would say they're home, but it's not. It's usually your base where your license is held because you are actually a member of that real estate firm. I know that one's hard to accept, but you are actually an employee, basically. You're 1099, but you are a statutory employee of that real estate firm. So where your license is hanging is not your home. Your license is hanging at that business. So they, a lot of times they think they're self-employed because they're an independent contractor. They try to count the mileage between their home and their real estate office because they don't drive there very often. They only go there once in a while for a meeting or to use the office. They're out showing homes and all this, and their base is their house, okay? But that's not the case to the IRS. In that case, their home is where their license is, okay? Now, if you are a distributor of something, like a lot of people will be um, some people who are with MLMs and that sort of thing, they will have um, their home as their primary base. Well, in that case, they are actually running their business out of their home. And when they go out to places, yes, those mileage miles do count as transportation miles. Okay. That's when you show that your home is your home base but you have to be able to show that. Now, what does that mean? Now, anybody know what this year's, uh, you know, this, this past tax year's, what the mileage, uh, the mileage allowance was? Per mile? Per mile. 54 and a half. 54 and a half. Mm. Okay. So, 54 and a half. Okay. Why is it 54 and a half? What does that normally include? Everything. Everything. That means your gas, your insurance, your tire wear, depreciation. Um, yes. The reason is, is all of those are wrapped into it. Because it wouldn't normally cost you 54 and a half cents to drive a mile. Okay? That includes all of those. And that's what's really important okay yeah you have to explain that to people because they just don't get it right and that's one of the important things to explain to them because they think that well what about all these expenses those are all part of it those are all wrapped into it so it's not just saying oh well what about all these they're all part of that already they've been placed in there Okay, so that 54 and a half cents has your gas. And a lot of them, this is what's funny, a lot of them will go, I want this per miles, and here's where all my gas expenses were. Um, you don't get both. You well, know. They'll try to <laughs> their their uh, deductions for auto repair. Well, no, uh -huh. There you go, no. the auto repair deductions or tires. And then when you explain to them, it's either one or the other, actual or 54 and a half per mile. That's right. And, and they start adding up their actual, and it doesn't come anywhere near it. Nope. And then they go, well, why is it that? This was an expense. Isn't that an addition to it? No. You know, can't have it both ways. So 54 and a half percent, 54 and a half cents is actually a pretty good amount. And it's, it's actually pretty generous. Um, it includes, like I said, the registration, garage rent, repairs, gas, oil, tires, insurance, parking fees, 
uh, that sort of thing. Now, there is kind of an exception, but it's really sometimes people throw in there if there are additional tolls and whatnot that they normally do not pay. Sometimes those end up in there, but they're really not supposed to. They're supposed to be part of that 54 and a half cents. But they, those usually slide a little bit because tolls are not normal a normal expense. Mm. Okay. So tolls sometimes do get to slide as an additional expense, even though they're technically supposed to be part of that 54 and a half. Even parking fees. Yeah. So it does happen that sometimes things do slide by a little bit if they're out of the ordinary. Okay. But overall, that 54 and a half cents is supposed to cover everything in regards to your transportation. Now, the important thing with that is you need to keep your mileage log. Um, a lot of people do not understand that and do not do it um, or do not do it right. Okay. I think that would probably be the more important thing. Um, you cannot, and I, I cannot stress this enough, do not go out the night before an audit and realize that you did not keep your records for your mileage expenses, the IRS will look down on you a whole lot if you suddenly, the night before your audit, write out every mile that you can think of on a sheet of paper or type it up and print it up. They will go, this is not a mileage log. Okay, they know a mileage log normally is written in like 48 different pens, scribbled in notes on the side, you know, because they know you didn't use the same pen all year long. They know you didn't, you know, I mean, they, they, they have, there's a certain amount of reality that has to come into play here. So when you have a mileage log, it's not going to be uniformly typed up. Um, the exception is if you do have, a mileage tracker and those are actually what I advise everybody I talk to to ever to use is something where it actually checks your GPS okay because then you can just you know there are certain ones you swipe left if it's a business one you swipe right if it's a personal one guess what works great it is one of the best ways to do it okay do not uh, try to get away with, I just typed up this spreadsheet with every mile I had um, for last year, the night before. Okay? They aren't going to accept it. Um, you are going to be in trouble. So, just don't try to do that. Um, oh, your mileage tracker, does that print up a report? It will. But it, it shows, it actually has a date and time a date and time stamp each type each time it does it right it's a computer logged one and you can just print up the report and that's great then because it actually has date and time and log uh, uh, geo recording where you were and that's that's perfect the irs loves that then they know this is your actual mileage this is you know but what happens is is when you get those people who their favorite pastime is i didn't track my mileage oh god i don't have anything and they'll sit there on the night before in the same pen, write out 12 months worth of mileage that they can make up. All right. The IRS is going to look at it and go, you wrote this last night. You know, it's like the ink still smears, you know. And it's like, this is not a, a mileage log. So that's the biggest thing is make sure it is a real mileage log and they do accept things here's one of the cool things that they do accept they accept printouts from google if you need to know mileage and you don't know how many miles it was you can write down the date and time and you don't know sure how many miles it was pull it up on google and say here's the map it says this is many miles print it up put it with your log Guess what? That's proof of how many miles it was. They accept that. They know that it's been mapped out 48 million times by Google. 
you know, the Google satellite knows exactly how many miles it was. And that should have probably been the route you took. And it will get, and it will, they will accept that. Okay. They're really good about that. They're reasonable. But that's one of the most important things about transportation is when you have mileage, it's a set amount and it doesn't include, you know, I mean, it, it has everything wrapped into it. You cannot start adding the additional expenses to it. Okay. You either have to have the actual expenses for everything or just accept the mileage expense, which honest to God, take the mileage expense because the actual expenses will never add up to the other. Okay. All right. That's transportation. And again, like I said, there is one really great thing. Lease costs. If you lease a car and it's just for business, man, everything is in there. Okay. The car payment, everything. That's a great way to do it. Lease a car and use it for business. Lease it under the business name. Okay. It's an awesome way to do it. Okay. Now this one is fun. Anybody know what a business gift is? For clients and customers. But I mean, are, are there any kind of restrictions on it or is there? Limited to $25. That's the cool thing. It's a $25 gift. Okay. Most people will try to give unbelievable amounts and claim it's a business expense. They'll say it's a promotional expense. They'll say it's a, um, things like this to try to get it um, because there's a difference, okay? Business gifts are one thing. And these are the things like baskets, um, gift cards, things like that. They're 25 bucks, okay? And that's cool. You go visit somebody and, you know, you bring something to them, right? You bring them flowers, bring them whatever, okay? It's limited to 25 bucks. Now, there is an important exception. Know what that is? No. If it clearly is a promotional item, in other words, if it's something that has your name imprinted on it, so it's clearly a promotional item, something like that, it's not limited to the um, $25 limit. So it can be above the $25. Like how realtors... A lot of realtors give those Cutco knives because they can be engraved. Customized to them, engraved to them. There you go. So what ends up happening is, is if you can have something personalized. Um, now, I know it sounds funny, but a lot of times uh, they have, uh, when you sell a sign, or when I sell a house, sometimes they'll give this um, almost like hand carved wood sign for the house saying, you know, like established 2012 or whatever it is in the family name. And it's a beautiful sign. They cost about 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is down at the very bottom of it, it will say um, a gift from what it, or for from the realtor's name and that sort of thing at the bottom of it. And the reason is, is they need to have the realtor's name on there because that sign costs about 150 bucks to get. And as a result, it's a great big, beautiful sign for the inside of the house with the family name on it and all this, but it will have that on the very bottom or on the, you know, so it's, now showing that it was provided by or you know as a gift from 
a realtor. So as long as it has, as long as it's imprinted, and it has to be imprinted, it actually has to be part of it, so it can be seen as an advertisement, then it's considered a promotional item. And that's what you have to show in every case. If you want to get outside of that $25 limit, you do have to have the uh, your name imprinted on it. Now, here's a cool one. There is a neat exception on the gift cards. You know what they are? There are places which actually banks, which will provide you with the gift cards imprinted with your business name on them. So you can get them the Visa and MasterCards. MasterCards primarily. I don't think they do much with the Visa. But with the MasterCards, you can have them. You know how you can customize uh, MasterCards with like your favorite team logo and that sort of thing? You can also get them customized gift cards. You have to order them directly from the bank. You can get them customized with your company information on them. Mm -hmm. As a result, they now become a promotional item. Okay, because you are advertising yourself. Those can go over the $25 limit. But remember, that's the exception. It has to be a promotional item. It cannot be a generic item. If it's a generic item, it's limited to the $25. Okay. If it goes, if it, if it's above the, and it, and it, now, if it is valued at like, it's a $75 floral arrangement. It's a beautiful thing. Now here's the question. How much can you claim of it? $25. $25. But, but but if it has a card. No, card doesn't count. No. No, because that's not a promotional thing. If the no vase has card any. on the flower. If the vase is actually now remember it has to be something permanent. It has to be something imprinted. That's the that's the important part. Uh, okay. If the vase is engraved with provided by or whatever your realtor and that sort of thing it now becomes a promotional item so the card will not count if card doesn't count cards are something you can take and throw away ah, the okay. idea yeah, is the idea is it has to be something permanent. that is a permanent part of the item that makes it an advertisement piece so that next week, it'll still be there saying, here's what I did. So as long as they're using it, it's still reminding them of your, your involvement. Okay? So that's how you get around it. Mm -hmm. Okay? But that's very important. It has to be a permanent engraving it has to be something where it's permanently imprinted on it in other words not just you can't hand write a card and say that it's on there and it has to be visible okay otherwise if it's just on a card would anybody see it uh -huh. no nope so nobody's going to see it it's not really an advertisement then it has to be something that's actually visible Okay, so you can justify it. You can say, see, here's my name right here engraved on this. Or here's my name in, in, uh, uh, etched into this. Okay, that's the important thing. And you have to be able to show that. Because then it's now a form of marketing. Okay. So that's how you get around it. Now, if it doesn't have that... And that, and because let me, honest to God, let me know anybody can find a deal of flowers for like under 25 bucks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, good yeah, luck with that one. Pick from my garden, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. Something I found in my garden. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, honest to God, and, and have them delivered. You know, it's like, yeah, let's see. I'm going to have flowers delivered for under 25 bucks. Good luck with that one. Um, so what do you get to claim? And what happens to the remainder amount? It goes away. It yeah. It goes away. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. You can only deduct the $25. After the $25 amount, that's the limit. So it's considered just a lost business expense, basically. It's one of those expenses for doing business that does not get to be deducted from your overall business expense. Now, here's the question. Now, Sheila, maybe you can answer this. This will mm -hmm. be really important. Where does that go on the balance sheet? You mean the gift thing? Yeah, well, let's say that expense. you're looking at... It, it goes on there as an expense, I'd but when, you, when you're offsetting it, remember, you can only claim that 25% basically as a business expense. What about the additional 50 bucks that it cost? How do you allocate for that $50? That was oh, I see what you're it? saying. So let's say something costs you $100, right. and you can only claim the $25 in business in expense, expense right. for the IRS. Correct. I mean, technically, you can't count it. Mm -hmm. But you do have to allocate for the expense, in a sense, because you are spending it. Advertising? Advertising, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually how you do it. It's considered an advertising expense, but it's not deductible as... It's an expense, but not as a business gift expense. So you like separate it, twenty five dollars to gift and seventy five dollars. There you got to it. There you got it. Now you understand. You actually have to start dividing it up because you still have to allocate for the additional amount. Right. Because you can't just say, "Well, it's in the air somewhere." No. Okay. So it still has to be allocated for, so it becomes an advertising expense. Just like that that uh, example that we did with the barter. You have to count the extra expense somewhere. Correct. Correct. There you go. You have to count the expense. It's still considered an expense, but unfortunately, it doesn't count to it as a deductible expense. Right. As much as that sucks, it doesn't count as a deductible expense. It counts as basically a... You, it, it, you have to plug it in somewhere where it makes sense, basically. Right. And anything of this nature would be a, uh, an advertising expense, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yep. So you do have to still count it. It's just not going to count like you, like you thought it's going to count as a different type of expense. So you got it. Thank you, Sheila. That was perfect. Cause that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so no matter what, you still have to allocate for it. You still have to count it as an expense because the business can't just say, well, I don't know where it went. It was, uh, it's an expense that I don't, you know, I didn't actually, you know, I had it, but it's not an expense that just, you know, doesn't count anywhere. It's still got to be allocated somewhere. And so that's what you end up allocating it for as it becomes an advertising expense. So, all right. So business gifts are pretty much, if it doesn't have your name on it, it's 25 bucks. Okay, if it doesn't have your name on it, if it has your name imprinted on it, awesome. But it, like I said, it has to be imprinted on it. In other words, it has to be part of the item. Um, because if it's not, then if it's just your name on a card, like we were saying in the flowers, it can't just be your name on a card because then nobody sees it. Okay, it has to be justifiable as an advertising expense. Okay, provided by, you know, Jim's real estate firm, you know, something of that nature. All right. So that's the important thing. It has to show that. So that's what you need to know with business expenses, uh, business gifts, $25 limit on anything that is not imprinted. The only exception is if it is permanently and visibly imprinted on the item that it can go past it. All right. Yeah. 
Charitable donations. What is considered a charitable do donation? Money or property to a nonprofit organization. There you go. That's pretty much it. But here are a couple of major, major things about charitable donations as a business expense. This is the big difference. If you make a charitable donation, you go make it to the church. You go to church and you put money in the church, in the coffers, or however you're going to make the donation. What ends up happening? You get to deduct it. Okay? It's a personal donation. Businesses, however, are the exception. Businesses, as a result of being a business, cannot typically just make charitable donations. Okay? They have to, unfortunately, only a C corporation can make a deductible charitable contribution. Now, all of them can make a charitable do donation. Don't get me wrong. They can all make a charitable donation. But for it to be deductible, deductible. that's the important thing. For it to be dedu deductible, it's only can be made by a C corporation. Okay? And it has specific limits. Okay? The deduction is limited to 10%. And this is the important thing, 10% of taxable income. All right. And we're going to get into that in much later detail when we get into C-Corps, what their, what their uh, limits are and what they're, what, they're doing, what they're required to do when we get into their detailed information. But only a C-Corp can deduct a charitable donation. Now, it doesn't mean that the other ones can't make them. They can all make them. They can all make charitable donations. But only a C Corp can actually deduct the charitable donations. Okay, now, is that because an S Corp is passed through? Correct. It's because they are a pass through. Because um, a C Corp is the only one that actually really holds on to the, all of the deductions themselves. Mm hmm. And so the donations do not just pass through to their, to their people. All the other ones, partnerships and all, have some form of pass through. Right. Now, self-employed taxpayers cannot claim um, a, a contribution on their business expenses but they can claim a deduction on their Schedule A if they itemize because they are self-employed. Uh-huh. Okay. That's the one one way they can do it. If they itemize, because, you know, there is contra uh, charitable contributions on your itemized deductions. But that's for okay. specifically self-employed people. Okay. Because you can choose to do it as a self-employed person. Um, that's that's self-employed and LLC. And LLC, correct. And LLC, because you really are an LLC. You're basically self-employed. Uh, self um, so, so if I'm doing craft fairs and um, like especially during the Christmas craft fairs, mm -hmm. I always like to. Um, oh, there's, there's my phone. Is that your phone um, call? Oh, I might. Um, hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. But yeah, if you think about it, the deduction is based upon where does it finally end. So with the charitable deductions, with a self-employed person, they're going to do their itemized deductions. If they itemize, it ends up on their Schedule A. With a C corporation, it ends with the C corp because it's right. not going to be passed on from them. So it ends up in their expenses. But all the other ones really are a pass-through in some way. Mm -hmm. So they are they may be able to do it on their respective returns, like if they're a partnership or an S-corp, by their partners and shareholders 
if they choose to at the very end. So deduction, you know, contributions, if they pass through on the individual people, if they um, do an itemized or however they're going to do their individual taxes, there may be a charitable uh, donation that uh, their corporation makes. So, and it does pass then through to them like a soul, like a self-employed person. Right. But it is possible, but that gets really complicated when a partnership does it or when an S corp does it. Got it. But it's uh, because it's passing through to them. It is possible for the donations to be counted for them, but it gets really complicated with the S corp and with a partnership because it's really passing through a donation uh, to them. But like I said, the self-employed people, you know where it's ending. They're self-employed. So if they do an itemized deduction, let me see here. I think that's Lisa's call here. Hang on a second here. She put something in chat. Okay. Yeah, Lisa, she just said she's going to step away from the computer for about five minutes because she was, yeah. I think she was getting that call about her. The, her daughter. T- her daughter. So. Um, yeah, can I ask you a, a, a silly question regarding S corps? Sure. If an S corp has a has a business loss, mm-hmm. and that person is is married filing joint, can is is that loss passed through to the to the joint uh, tenancy return? Yes. Yeah, because they're filing jointly. They're both assuming um, the loss, basically. I right. mean, if they file married filing separately, then it could end up on one or the other. Right, right. But if they're married filing jointly, they're basically assuming um, loss. a loss jointly. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, yeah, they're, they're – um, so, yeah, they are basically – when they file jointly, mm-hmm. they're assuming the uh, combined loss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell you what, let's give Lisa just a minute so she can have that phone call and give her like her five minutes so she can have it quick and then we'll come right back to it. Okay. Cause I don't want her to miss any part of it. Yeah, sure. Just for that phone call. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's just take five minutes. So Ryan, um, yeah. I, I need to schedule that first part of my, um, EA test some, sometime soon. Okay. All right. Well, that was good. Okay. Well, we were just talking about the charitable deductions. You were you were asking the question there, Lisa. You had said something about a charitable deduction. Are we still going to take five minutes? Yeah, actually, let's do that. Let's go ahead and take the five minutes. And uh, come back in five minutes. Okay. Okay. Sound good? All right.
Okay, guys, sorry about that. I was trying to get, I had a call about our LTC class. You guys there? Yes. There we go. Yes. All right. Sorry, we had a call about our LTC class to start here in a little bit. All right. Let's get back to our charitable deductions. So, as we understand, the charitable deductions are only deductible when it ends with that tax preparer. In other words, um, if it actually ends up on their taxes. So that's why it's deductible for a C corporation, but it's not deductible with the S corp or the partnership because it passes through to the partners or passes through to the member, the shareholders of the S corp. Okay. That's also why, like I said, if it is an LLC or a sole proprietorship, it can, um, if they're self-employed, um, it can pass through to them to their itemized deductions if they do, um, if they do itemize. Okay? That's the only way. That's mm -hmm. on the Schedule A, and that's the only way that it can actually pass through to them. All right? Make sense on that. That's why charitable deductions are really not that hard. They just simply are who actually claims them. It's passing through. They're not able to do it because it's actually going to pass on to somebody else. And remember the limit. It's up to 10% of the taxable income. Okay. That's the most important thing. 10% of the taxable income. For a corporation. For a corporation. Correct. All right. Capitalized costs. All right. These are pretty simple. Okay. Capitalized deductions, uh, they are um, deductible, but they are, they can either deduct them currently or they can do, uh, be an addition to the basis of a related asset. Okay. But that's way beyond, that's something we're going to be covering in, in, in basis. But yes, they are deductible. It's just, it depends upon the item. Okay. And these are usually, in a sense, the startup costs or the, not necessarily the startup costs, but the um, investment um, in different equipment, um, retooling a factory, something that involves um, a large capital expense. Okay. And those are things that normally they are all deductible or they become part of the basis, but they are not, they're handled on their own. So as we know, yes, they are going to be deductible. Okay. But they're going to be deductible in a specialized way because you have a large expenditure it's going to be depreciated over time. It's going to be, um, if it's a loan, you're going to amortize it, you know, that sort of thing. Capital expenditures. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. But that would be handled separately. All right. That wouldn't be something you would just normally have as, as a regular expense. Okay. Miscellaneous expenses. These are fun, okay? This category is thrown in here because there are a whole lot of things that don't fall into a general category, okay? They don't occur all the time. They occur once in a while. And so as a result, the IRS does not have a category for them. Okay, 
They don't have a specific travel expense. They don't have a specific entertainment expense. They don't have a general business expense, and they're usually too small um, uh, to incur um, a capital expenditure. All right, so they occur over they they occur right away. They're a regular expense, but they may be a one-time expense. They may be a recurring every year expense, but they're usually small, maybe a hundred dollars, maybe seventy-five dollars, and they are not a normal expense. So let's look at some of what they what they might be. What are some of your ideas as to what miscellaneous expenses would be? Ideas? What would you count as a miscellaneous expense into that category as it becomes the junk drawer of expenses? Let's put it that way. Okay. What would you say would fall into the category of miscellaneous expense? Nothing's coming to mind at the moment. <laughs> See, that's, the, that's the drawing a blank kind of thing. Yes, I understand that one too. Okay. Believe it or not, there's one really common one that is a miscellaneous expense that is because it occurs just randomly. A lot of times it's a last minute expense that most people don't think of as a miscellaneous expense. And it's probably one of the most common one. It's advertising. What ends up happening is a lot of times, like we were talking about that gift that right. uh, was that extra seventy five dollars. Uh huh. Think about it. You got to. You've got to allocate the seventy five dollars so you don't even know where to stick it. Okay. So it becomes a miscellaneous expense. Okay. It doesn't have a, a uh, regular category. Advertising falls under this category because what, become, what is an advertisement? Okay. What's the definition of an advertisement? Something that would promote your company. There you go. Anything that promotes your company. This could be literally anything from a sticker to a magnet on the side of your car to uh, the vinyl decals on your windows to your business cards to uh, an advertisement on TV to your letterhead is not considered an advertisement. Mm -hmm. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, your letterhead is an advertisement for you. Okay. So there are thousands of things that could be considered an advertisement. What are some of the other things you could think of? Craziest things. Pens with your company's <laughs> logo pens. and name on them. Those pens. Does anybody actually read the side of the pens? Be honest. I've got one in front of me right now. Uh -huh. It's kind of funny that everybody spends money on those pens. Now, occasionally when you're looking for one and you think about it, when you need one, believe it or not, it's like you go, oh, I need a cab company. And you're looking for that phone number for the cab. You can never find the phone number to a cab. Um, then you, when you're doing something else, guess what? On the side of every pen you find, there's a phone number for a cab company. And you're going, I don't need one right now. I needed one last week. But you can't find it when you needed it, but... Every time when you don't need it, there's a pen with one on it. So those pens, um, the magnets on the side of your refrigerator. Okay. I love those things. I don't know why. I know they're supposed to be reminding you that, you know, hi, I'm your realtor. Remember me when you're going to want to sell your house. Mm -hmm. um, in 20 years. In 20 years. Be honest, how many people actually keep that magnet on the side of their refrigerator and look at it and go, oh, you know, I think in six months I'm going to sell my house, I'm going to call that person. Does anybody have the magnet from their realtor on the side of their refrigerator right now? 
No. No, but I still have the coffee cup. You got the coffee. There you go. That's one right there, the coffee cup. Actually, I, the co I the co still have my magnets from when I ha owned a dog grooming business, and that was, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. I still have one of those magnets on my fridge. <laughs> there you go. Now, see, that's not so bad. Um, like the coffee cup right now I have is I picked the biggest coffee cup because I wanted coffee this morning. And I think it's one of Shell's coffee cups. It says, let me adjust my crown and get my day started. It has a big tiara on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hmm, definitely not one of the ones I would normally pick, but it was like one of the biggest coffee cups I could find. Yeah, I've so. got coffee cups from when I was a, a financial advisor from different um, mutual fund companies. There you go. There you go. And so all of these, um, the CDs. Remember at one point there were cassette tapes? Ah, uh, yes. Everybody People gave out. There. Uh -huh. Everybody gave out the cassette. Those were the coolest thing in the world. Everybody gave out the cassette tape with their ad on it. It was a little marketing speech. It was like 15 minutes long. Here, oh, here, listen to this. And they sold them for like nine ninety five to the realtors, to the people with the MLMs and us. They made a fortune to the actual person, you know, who's their salesperson. But, man, I don't think anybody sold much off of the actual cassette tape. Because I don't think too many people actually listened to them. Mm -mm. But, uh, yeah, the cassette tapes, those were really cool. And then we had... Uh, after that, the CDs came out, and then everybody mailed out CDs to everybody. Uh, then the mini CDs came out. Um, oh, the one that I really loved was the Coke cans. Personalizing the Coke cans. Those were really cool. You actually put your business name, because you can still do that. You can get the Coke cans personalized with your business name on them and whatnot. You can send it off to Coke, and they'll put your logo on the on the, you know, twelve pack of Coke. Those are all miscellaneous advertising. I mean, if you flip through, there are companies that will put your name on anything. I mean, literally. Uh, Shell's got the coolest little printer. It's a handheld printer. It's uh, I can't remember. It starts with an X. Anyways, it will print on just about any surface. In other words, the printer, you program it, and then you put the uh, information into it, and it's a handheld printer, and you lay it on the surface of something and roll it across something, and where you roll it across, it'll actually print what you have uh, programmed into it. So you can actually go on just about any surface and imprint your information, your logo, your name, whatever you want, right on it. I mean, as a as a uh, marketing thing, that's awesome. I mean, you can make, turn anything into a marketing piece. Okay. But that's, again, the important thing. What does it have to have for it to be considered a marketing piece? Your business name. It must be visible and it must be permanent. In other words, it must be imprinted into it. So it's not just... It's not just uh, uh, like it's handwritten. It must be imprinted on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it must be visible, you know, and it can be your slogan, your trademark, your logo, your um, whatever it is. I mean, okay, let's put it this way. Who does not know what the Golden, Ar the golden Arches is? Nobody. I mean, golden I don't, arches is McDonald's. it's McDonald's. It's the golden yeah. arches. Um, do you realize what the golden arches actually are? It's a logo. No, it's not just a logo. It's actually, it was designed specifically to look the way it does. Do you know why? No, it was actually, <laughs> get this. It was employed by a psychologist to, and they do this in their logos to symbolize certain things. That, but in it, it, to me, it looks like a church. 
Mm-mm. It's actually supposed to be two breasts. Oh my god! <laughs> mm-hmm. That is actually what the two. And if you look I at them from the side, maybe a rainbow. No, it is actually it is actually supposed to be um, to uh, give you that feeling of momism and the comfort of home and your your uh, home cooking and your feeling of of uh, comfort. It was actually employed to be two breasts. Yeah, they they do this with all types of logos. Okay. And okay, I, um, I just went through like five of my companies that uh-huh. I work with, and there are no miscellaneous expenses. Wow. None? Everything's been categorized. Really? Yeah. Now, that is, honest to God, that is strange. Because do you know what the most common miscellaneous expense is? I mean, advertising is categorized as advertising. Mm-hmm. So, it's got its it's got its own it's got its own now that's rare for company for companies to do all that that's rare but and most of these you know they're they're one of them is a million dollar two of them are million dollar companies mm-hmm. uh gross and and the others are smaller but yeah that nothing. is that is amazing um because most do not do that because most people don't realize what the most common um expenditure is petty cash petty cash is a bank account right but what ends up happening is is when they try to account for it it ends up falling into miscellaneous expenses most of the time uh, no they don't they better have a and they better right. have an accounting and, and, for petty cash yeah and that's they usually what, what slapped. i know and i i've told them I, I tell them that all the time and you know what ends up happening they have this slush fund that they usually say that it's kind of like, oh, well, that, that came out of petty cash. That came out of petty cash. That was, the, here's the expense for petty cash. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're always like, um, that's not an expense account. No. And the way I no. make them take, take account of it is I put like a, you know, like a check register uh-huh. in the petty cash box. And if you're going to take anything out, you have to write it down and say you what it's You have for. to write it down. There you go. Thank you. And you have to allocate it because right. what ends up happening is, is unfortunately most companies treat petty cash as just a miscellaneous expense category. Okay. It's like whatever came out of it. Okay. It was this and they have no accounting for it. They just kind of say, well, this came out of petty cash. Well, what was it and what was it used for? And what was it? But I don't remember. Here's the receipt. Not in, not in my world. Let's nope. put it that way. No, I know. And it's amazing because, you know, especially little companies, they're all the time trying to do that. And I'm like, no. And, uh, or their petty cash is basically a shoebox full of receipts. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Not going to happen. But advertising is, is its own category. You know, and a lot of, and it should be. In all honesty, it shouldn't just be a miscellaneous category, but it is considered a miscellaneous expense because of so many things that fall into it, and because of its broad range, where anything with your imprint on it can be considered for advertising. And also, now remember, if it's promoting your company. Even if it doesn't necessarily have the imprint on it, um, it can, in a sense, fall under advertising. This is where it's a little bit gray. So there are times when you do something for somebody and next thing you know, it kind of falls under. Well, I was doing a promotion thing for them. I was trying to help them out and do this, you know. Would a website be considered advertising? Well, you bet. you bet. If it has your okay, company good. logo, I put it in the right category. Because it's got your, it normally has your your company logo on it. It normally has your name, your phone number. That's advertising. You're promoting your business. Mm-hmm. You're using Anything the internet. You do to promote your business. Yes. Advertising. So, and as a matter of fact, that's one of the important categories down here. Now, credit card convenience fees. Okay. 
when you use this, when you use your credit cards, a lot of times there is an acceptance fee just for doing, using the credit card there. That is a miscellaneous fee. That's a cost of doing business. Um, that falls under, now some people have an, a special category that they create for transaction fees. Of course. Um, and that's actually the way you should do it. Um, but technically these fall under a miscellaneous fee, but you should have a category for transaction fees. It depends on how technically you get as an accountant. I'm technical enough. I would say, yes, it needs to be under a transaction fee. Um, so you can discern it as to what it is, but yes, a credit card convenience fee is considered a miscellaneous expense. Trademark fees. Um, I would actually have that under advertising or something of that nature, or if you're doing it, depending on how much it costs to establish this trademark, trademark that may actually end up as a capital expense. Because I got news for you, trying to trademark a McDonald's logo or something of that that nature costs a whole lot more than, you know, than just, you know, 50 bucks. But trademark fees are, are depending upon the size of what you're trying to do. That's, this, this is, okay, trademark fees is kind of a broad category in a sense because it falls under the category of branding. Um, your branding fees to make your company known, that can be a big fee. So I know it's falling under miscellaneous fees, but that can be a lot of money. Um, and that can actually fall under another type of advertising fee. Okay. But yes, trademark fees are technically part of it. Educational and training fees. Now, Again, this falls under why it's why the um, the test now understand something. This is where it falls under for the IRS and for the testing purposes. Okay. Personally, I would put this under its own category. I would separate it out and have educational fees under their own category. But a lot of times, this is educational fees and training fee expenses for employees, okay? Um, I would have it under its own category entirely. But for purposes of the test, it falls under miscellaneous expenses. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I agree, Sheila. I'm kind of like, Really? I mean, I would have it under my, uh, you know, there's, you know, like, like you said, there's credit card fees goes under transaction fees. Advertising would be its own, own category. Trademark fees. I I don't think would be under, it would be under its own. It would actually probably mm -hmm. be under a capital expenditure in a sense. Um, and education and training fees, that would be its own category entirely. Um, it's called sloppy bookkeeping. Yeah, exactly. Internet related fees. This is where we were talking about when you said about the website. These are the things for domain names, things like that. Okay. Now, again, sloppy bookkeeping um, because I would have all those fees separated out under my technology fees. Mm -hmm. um, but for the testing purposes, they treat it as a miscellaneous expense. Okay. Okay. So again, like I said, uh, I'm category uh, categorizing these based upon the testing requirements, not on, I would do a whole lot. Maybe I'm a little more anal retentive. I don't know, but. We're on the IRS instead of the bookkeeping. Book. Yeah, really. Yeah. Not, not accounting, yeah. but IRS regs. Exactly. Tax prep fees, uh, I mean, tax, tax prep fees. Guess what? That's considered a miscellaneous expense. Okay. Our fees, our fees for doing the taxes, that's a miscellaneous expense. Okay. Again, so I, um, individuals can't take that, but businesses can? Businesses can because they have to count it as an expense. 
uh, for doing business because they are required to file. Individuals, they may or may not be required to file. Okay, remember, they may or may not have to file where um, corporations, there's only one type of corporation and it's not really, you know, the nonprofit, you know, the churches are the only ones that are not required to file. All the other ones have to file. There's not an option for them. Okay. Which is an important fact. People usually file and are supposed to, but there are exceptions where people are not required to file. And we know that all the time. Okay. There are certain exceptions to where they are not required to file. Um, but as a business, no matter what you are required to file. So that's one of the things that's, uh, so as a result, basically it is considered an expense. Okay. License fees. If you're a business, the licensing requirements are considered a miscellaneous fee. Okay, now again, sloppy accounting. Uh, tax, you know, the, the, this is, again, this is for the tax purposes and not accounting purposes. I like the way you guys put that. That was very good. Okay. Okay, because I would have these in separate categories, not, uh, not all grouped under miscellaneous expenses. Yeah, I have but, those all in different categories, too, on my bookkeeping. Good for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I would, too. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But for tax purposes, they consider them all under miscellaneous expenses. Now, this is what's really funny. This is considered a miscellaneous expense. Repairs to business property. <laughs> now. That would be one I would never consider as a miscellaneous expense. Uh, repairs and maintenance. Because especially if you have rental property and you are a business where you have, those would be a major expense. Yeah. And I cannot see that as a miscellaneous expense. But again, like like you guys said, this is how the IRS treats it, not how I would treat it. So you guys are absolutely right. This is how the IRS looks at it, that those are miscellaneous expenses. Now, what do you think would be repairs to a business property? The plumbing? Anything to an, an asset basically is considered a repair to a business property. And why it would ever be considered that, um, it's anything to a business, including the cost of labor and supplies. Hmm. And I would have that in its own separate category. Why it would be considered as a miscellaneous expense, I honestly think that that should be in its own category extremely. But... You know, like I said, I don't, I, I, I don't agree with these necessarily in this sense. I think they should be in their own categories for accounting purposes, but they're not. This is something the IRS counts them as um, miscellaneous expenses. And there are a few other ones um, that are considered miscellaneous, which are like a little out there subscriptions and mem memberships to trade magazines and professional organizations um is this based on the tax form maybe you know actually that's true that's probably based on what it, what it's based on mm -hmm. because that makes sense. um uh, they also have penalties paid for late performance or non-performance of a contract. I'm like, that's almost a lawsuit, <laughs> you right. know. So, so I don't 
you know, necessarily agree with all these things that they have under miscellaneous expenses, but they are for tax purposes, they are considered a miscellaneous expense. Mike, I can see on the tax form how if they've, they've got some categories, but then they throw all of these other things into miscellaneous, that would make sense in, in a reporting kind of way. Yes, yes, in that sense it would make sense because then it would be just, because there's no actual category for these necessarily right. individually. Exactly. And so, yes, it would make sense in that case because there's not a... a general cat there this is kind of like the general category for everything that doesn't fall into into the above mm -hmm. or the tax form would be like 50 pages yeah yeah and it's true and so it is in that sense true so this is for tax again like i said this is for tax purposes so when you go through the tax form the tax form does include things like mileage, transportation, meals, uh, that sort of thing on the form. And when you come to uh, certain other expenses, there is no place for it. Yeah. And so, yes, that does make sense in this case. And thank you, Sheila. That's a very good point to point out uh, because that does make it a little more understandable because these categories are insane to, <laughs> to, to put them all in. Yeah, miscellaneous. To, into miscellaneous. Um, that's kind of like saying, well, here, just everything goes into miscellaneous. And no, it, it actually does make more sense when you think about it that way. Thank you. That, mm -hmm. that uh, actually is a better way to explain it because – not everything should be a miscellaneous expense, but as there is no category for so many of these things on the form, that they do have to treat them as a miscellaneous expense because they couldn't track them all. The, the, yes, you're right. Thank I mean, you. Because the form would be 50 pages long. Mm -hmm. Um. So in looking at it with the business expense, especially, I mean, there's already enough forms because every single tax uh, entity type basically has its own type of form. Right. So by the time you got done, I mean, they would have chopped down the entire rainforest just to do our taxes in a year. Mm -hmm. um, so to make everything a miscellaneous category does make sense in that case. Um. So if it doesn't fall under one of the immediate categories, like I said, business gifts, charitable deductions, um, travel expense, uh, 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 capital deductions, things like that, then it will fall somewhere under a miscellaneous expense. Um, because you're right, they could not have every category on the form. And uh, thank you for pointing that out, because that is very, very true. And that's why it never made sense to me either to put all these things into a miscellaneous mm -hmm. uh, miscellaneous category. Um, but for tax purposes, then, like I said, for the tax form, because think about every category that's outside of the form would fall under a miscellaneous expense. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, questions on expenses, because that's the last one. The only thing left are what are actually, and we kind of touched on it, what are not deductible expenses. And they're really simple. It, it, it's anything that involves a political campaign or lobbying. Now, that's an actually one that's up for debate is – Lobbying costs, because a lot of companies say that, well, my lobbying costs are part of my expenses to do business because I need to have these laws favor what I'm doing, okay? No, they're not, okay? And they spend millions of dollars. I mean, a company often spends as much in lobbying costs as they do in advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody knows, you know, like 
the NRA spends more in lobbying costs, I think, than they do in advertising. Probably do. But um, the reason is, is because the laws that govern what they are involved with affect them more than anything else. So the lobbying costs that they put forth are much more than a lot of the advertising because they don't have to necessarily advertise. Like I said, the NRA doesn't necessarily advertise. The NRA has to keep gun laws in their favor. Um, Many of the other ones that are lobbying all the time, uh, uh, there's a lot of legal immigration stuff that are lobbying all the time that have to do with um, immigration and anything associated with immigration. Um, that's police actions. Um, most people don't realize that the cost of police actions is huge. And a lot of those are private organizations, security firms that um, deal with um, border patrol and that sort of thing are often private security firms. Okay. So their expenses are directly related to those political actions that are currently being debated. Okay. So what ends up happening is, is they actually lobby and try to influence things in their direction. Well, for some companies, uh, pharmaceutical firms, that's probably one of the biggest ones is that they are always attempting to uh, influence the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, in regards to their testing principles. Okay. Because most people don't realize that before a drug can actually go to market, the pharmaceutical companies will have spent billions of dollars to have the drug developed tested and clinically analyzed to try to find out what its um, effects are. And it may have taken 10 to 15 years before the drug can ever be released. And so the drug is basically has at that point, now here's the important part. When you think about a drug, its patent is how long? Seven years. 20 years. Oh, it used to be seven. Well, the reason is, is what ends up happening is, is patents are usually for a 20 year period. In other words, you have it in a sense for 20 years, but seven years is your um, working life of it, basically. So during your development phase, okay, you have that time period so you can develop it do the clinical studies on it and then start to market it. Okay. That eats up that 20 years. So when you get done, you basically have five years. If you, if you're 10 to 15 years development, you basically have maybe five years of selling your product. Okay. So because the drug patent is 20 years, Mm-hmm. Um, after the approval from the FDA, the time frame is usually between seven and twelve. Exactly. Exactly. That's what you have left. Yeah. Then, then the generic companies come into the picture. Exactly. So when you think about it, you've put billions of dollars into that initial number of years. You have seven years, basically, seven to twelve years of actual marketing time with which you can sell your product hmm. tell you what hold on for one second somebody's at the door let me okay. I'll be right back Sheila what is that that is that the research and development of the product that in, yeah the 20 years includes research and development after it goes on the market then it's 7 to 12 years after that it can go generic So just think of one one of your more popular drugs. You know, it, it unless they make a, a, a basic change to that drug, yeah, it can go generic after seven to twelve years. 
But if they change the drug in some way, then they can get an extension of another 7 to 12. Okay. So, yeah. Like, here's an example. I have asthma, and one of my inhalers, they, they changed the packaging on the inhaler. Mm -hmm. So because the packaging was changed, it extended to an, another seven years. Strange but true. Mm -hmm. Are we all having fun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taxes are so much fun. Yes, they are. All the ifs, ands, and buts. Oh, this is the law, but this is the exception. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, and this is the exception, and this is the exception. Mm -hmm. And this is the exception to the exception with an exception. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, you know, God help us all because we're the ones that are trying to become enrolled agents. I know. Ay, ay, ay. Crazy stuff. There we go. Sorry about that. Deliveries. Okay. So, um, the things that are not deductible, as I was saying, are anything that involves political, um, political activities, uh, the lobbying events, the political contributions, things like that. Okay. Now I know that. For the in the past, now this is one of the things that was bad. In the past, those were deductible, and here's a major one that was deductible, that was an expense to companies until they basically abused it. That was the country club and golf club expenses. It used to be great; you could put the country club expenses in there, and until it became so abused. Um, and country club fees became so huge, that's in a sense why they did. They, they became exclusive because their fees were so high. But country club fees, anybody know what it costs to get into some of the more exclusive country clubs? Oh, $50,000 or better. Oh, yeah. Just to even get in the door. That's the basic fee to more or less apply. That isn't even the fee in some cases to... Um, to uh, actually get accepted. That's just a fee to apply. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are some there. They are really crazy on some of their, and the yacht clubs, you know, those, those sort of things. Some of the yacht clubs are an unbelievable expense. Well, so, the old saying is, if you have to ask what it is, you can't afford it. You can't afford it. Exactly. That's kind of like what was funny was is, uh, when they give you a menu if at, at the restaurant, if it doesn't have the prices, um, don't ask because yeah. you'd better be you'd better be able to afford it. Just know that whatever the bill right. comes, because if you don't, if you look at the menu and go, why are there no prices? You shouldn't be there. Uh huh. Um, one of the things that, and this is probably bad to say, um, I have a lot of friends who, as Noemi knows, who are Filipino. Um, girls decided to go out, and Shell was telling me that they went over to the Heathman Lodge. And at the Heathman Lodge, 
um, they had never gone over there and they were sitting down to dinner. Now, most of them are used to having things with dinner like rice and things like that, that they, most of them have never been over to a place similar to the Heathman Lodge, I was my assumption. And it's a very nice restaurant, you know, it's, um, Hudson's is the restaurant that's over there. And they sat down to dinner and they were looking at the menu and one of them literally looked at the uh, waiter who was there and said, um, do you guys serve rice? I don't even see rice on the menu. And he looked at her and goes, no, we do not. And it was just kind of like, you know, um, this is not the kind of place where, you know, you just, you know, it's like there, there's a, there's a point where you are not in the right establishment. If you are looking at the menu and completely confused. Mm-hmm. And it's just one of those things that country clubs are different than most other firms. High end luxury things are different, and that's why they don't count as expenses. Now, like I said, I when I was in Chicago, I had I was friends with the owners of several limousine companies, so I had limousines that I could use anytime I pretty much wanted to. I could call them up and just have one come to the door and take me and my friends out for the evening. Um, That was a lot of fun, especially when you're in your 20s and 30s. That's a lot of fun. But uh, for uh, I had a friend who owned a limousine company and um, on my daughter's uh, 17th birthday, by she was you know nine months pregnant but he came down and took her to uh to everywhere even mcdonald's to get you know something to eat because she really wanted to go to mcdonald's in a limousine Uh uh, she was in labor the whole time we were in the limousine but she was like i am not having this baby on my birthday (laughs) Uh uh-huh so, I mean, the baby was born the next day, but yeah, it was it, having a friend with the limousine company. Awesome. That I got to say is one of the most incredible things you could pretty much um, uh, most people don't know this, but um, one of my friends, the one, one of my friends, uh, years ago, uh, he owned Oak Brook limousine. Now you don't probably, many people don't know this, but, uh, Erica Harold was Miss America and she was from Oak Brook, Illinois. And, uh, so I've actually met her okay and years ago before that um i actually got to hang out with them once and that was fun because he owned the, the oak brook oak brook limousine because he was their driver there they became their um their uh limousine company she was Miss Illinois. So, so that was cool. So it's been that that's a lot of fun when you get to do stuff like that. You know. But and when you go up to concerts, by the way, and you pull up in the limousine, there is nothing better than that. When you go to a concert and you pull up in the limousine lane. That is the coolest thing in the in the world. 
you know, so that was fun. So, but uh, that lifestyle, it's hard.